It is 3 p.m. here in New York. And we're gonna get started. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, today we have another webinar in our series of webinars on the science of reading. Our goal for this webinar series is to help you gain critical insights into the key components of the science of reading framework and how to use them to inform reading instruction. The science of reading framework has recently gained popularity as you have seen in the news. Um, and unfortunately, in the process, the framework has been mischaracterized as a phonics-based reading instruction, mostly in K through three. But the science of reading is much more than that, and it's relevant in K through 12 and beyond. In fact, developing reading and literacy skills is a lifelong process. We're, we're all still learning. So today's webinar is going to help you expand your view on the science of reading beyond phonics. And we hope that you will leave today with more ideas and tools for helping students develop their reading proficiency in grades three through 12. Uh, this webinar is sponsored by CAPTI, which helps assess, advance, and accommodate reading. And today's speakers, and I'm just a facilitator, today's speakers, Dr. Margaret Opatz, uh, who is a former teacher and uh, currently a reading research scientist. Um, working here at CAPTI, and Sean Morrissey, a, a practicing teacher in the fifth grade. And Thank you. Yep. Yes. All right. Well, it's great to have you all here today. So uh, the way that today's uh, webinar will look is we're going to just take a really quick um, view of our current reality in education. And then we'll get into what is the science of reading. Um, don't worry, we won't bore you through that because I'm sure you've heard a lot about the science of reading, but we just really want to contextualize um, the, the rest of our session together. Um, so then as we move beyond uh, the science of reading, or move beyond um, that, that previous point into moving beyond phonics or expanding the science of reading beyond phonics, um, we're going to really dig into language comprehension and what that really looks like um, for students. And then we'll take a quick look at um, CAPTI Assess with Read Basics and then have a QA. and a So um, I want to start off by just kind of contextualizing everything. And, and if I'm um, speaking to educators, I'm sure you're already familiar with a lot of this. Um, however, when we think about our current reality of education, it's like we are like overwhelmed by the science of reading, like everywhere. Um, the second that anybody finds out that I am in the reading and literacy field, I get asked, have you listened to Soul the Story? And I guess it's not surprising because when you look at news right now, you see a lot about the science of reading and how states are really looking to change the curriculum in schools and really change the way that reading is taught and assessed. Um, but it's everywhere right now. And we even have states that, such as Louisiana, that are actually banning specific types of um, instruction. And it kind of leads us to like this, um, of the most recent NAEP scores, and we see that reading has fallen. And it's not just because of the way instruction has been done. Um, we also have like the COVID disruption. Um, but I think it's like, it's not surprising that this is everywhere right now um, in the education world, but also in the news. And one thing that seems to be very common in all of these news stories is that we're pointing to phonics as a way to um, teach reading through the science of reading lens. And I don't think that that's surprising because if you think about phonics, it's it's kind of an easy thing to grasp um, in terms of what the science of reading says. Um, it seems like everyone can kind of like understand what phonics is, but then when we get into those more advanced skills, um, not everyone can talk about those. Uh, so as I looked at all of the news articles that have come out, listen to Soul the Story, it kind of begs this question of, is the science of reading synonymous with phonics? And as I previously mentioned, it, it seems like in the 
greater world outside of education, the like popular media would suggest that phonics is synonymous with the science of reading. But I think as educators, we know that that's not the case. It's part of the science of reading, but that's it's not the whole field. So I really wanna just establish what the science of reading is. And this information comes from the Reading League. Um, I really like how succinctly they've put it together. So the Reading League defines it as this vast interdisciplinary body of scientifically based research um, with researchers that come from several different domains, um, such as like cognitive scientists, um, ling linguists, um, educators, special educators. And it's coming from five decades of research that has taken place across the world and in multiple languages. Um, and then the culmination of all of this uh, research is really to provide us with evidence that informs how proficient reading and writing develop, um, why it is expected that some will have difficulty learning to read and write. And then most importantly, this is this research really tells us and guides us in how to most effectively assess and teach reading. So now I'm gonna, Sean um, is going to walk us through Scarborough's reading room. Um, so Sean, take it away. Uh, so I, there's, there's, there's vast differences and in, in, in expertise. So those that are very familiar with um, the science of reading, you'll, you, you've probably seen this hundreds if not thousands of times. For, for those who are newer, obviously you haven't, you haven't seen it um, very much, but Scarborough's reading room is, is just a nice graphic that kind of like discusses all the different components that go into skilled reading. So there's there's kind of two like major aspects. Like one is word recognition, and um, so like word recognition, we'll talk about like decoding um, of words, um, like starting with like phonological awareness, just like the smallest um, parts of sounds like phonemes. So like can kids like segment sounds into words like the word cat can they can, can the kids hear that and know it's it's composed of cat um the coding is just of applying like phonics to like to, to, to readings so so i look at it i look at it as like today um i i did some oral reading fluency with my kids one minute reads like are they fluently reading um words, are they accurately decoding them, and are they um, doing it in a fluent way? Um, and sight recognition is, is basically like any word that you have in your, your long-term memory. So it's not like a, like to me, it's not like a sight word list, like um, the, the word paper boy is just a word that I have in my long-term memory, and if I see it in print, I can recognize it by sight. So, well, um, so when we talk about phoneme graphing correspondence, um, so English, um, we, we, we don't have like perfect correspondence like Finland with sounds representing um, like the graphemes in, in writing. Um, so we have 26 letters, but they like with letters and letters combinations, they make 44 different sounds. Um, so that's one of the, the difficulties about English is um, you know we we always hear like Finland is big big in the news like in the last five years, but it's very easy for Finnish kids to learn um, you know kind of their phonics because everything's one to one correspondence. Unfortunately, English is a little bit more complex. That's not surprising. Uh, we're really trying to now move beyond uh, phonics, so really expanding our view of the science of reading. So now Sean is going to just take us through the language language comprehension strands. It's, it seems like, we, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, phonics and kind of with Soul to Story and even like, you know, I'm on Twitter a lot. There's, there's, there's more so like sort of push from K through to like, we need to change some things with phonics. But the language comprehension strand is super important. Um, some of the big aspects that, you know, we, when we talk about language that affects reading, like background knowledge. Um, Students that have background knowledge in a topic are able to comprehend reading from that topic better than students that can't. So there, this is by study after study, background knowledge is very, very important. Um, in, in, in my district, I, I play a big part with vocabulary. Um, vocabulary, if, if kids are reading passages, you know, reading text, and they don't know like 98% of what the words mean, 
they're going to struggle. Um, you, you, you need to be close to 100% with understanding the vocabulary and the passages. So um, we're talking m many different types of vocabulary um, as well. Like there's, you know, we talk about like academic vocabulary, um, like words like function and things like that, that are very important, especially as kids move through um, the upper elementary grades and especially in middle and for sure um, high school. There's a couple other strands that we talk about too, is like language structures, like syntax. Do kids, do students understand um, like the pronouns? Like if, if a sentence is referring to like he or she, are they understanding that that, that pronoun is relating to a, a person that came before in, in, a, in a previous sentence? Um, verbal reasoning and literacy knowledge are also important, but I think we're gonna be talking today more about like the vocabulary part which to me is the main, uh, the main part in the language comprehension for sure. Great, thanks. Okay, I'm gonna zoom through this one. When we think about the language comprehension strands, I think it's, um, well, teachers are taught how to teach vocabulary. Um, and then there's some of these areas that are just more difficult to teach. Um, so what we really wanna do for the rest of our time together today is really look at what is it that students need to know um, to be successful with their with those specific language comprehension strands? So the first thing that they have to know is how academic language differs from conversational language. So when you walk into school, you are inundated by academic language. And it operates very different from conversational language. Um, so I have a couple of examples here. So uh, let's say that we walk into a cafeteria together and I point at the table and I say, let's sit at the table over there. And I give the gesture like to point over there. Like even if you were speaking in a language that you didn't know, you, you might understand what I'm saying if I like point and give that gesture. So it's also easy to know what a table is because it's, it's an object. You can touch it. You can see it. Then when we enter into the academic world, and the teacher might say something to like a fourth or fifth grader, let's examine the table on page whatever. That is a very different type of table. It presents data that has to be interpreted. And then you have to figure out, well, what does the data mean? How is the data represented? So table becomes a lot more abstract, even though it's it's something that you can look at, it, it has a lot of information that becomes abstract to students. Um, another example would be uh, if you were to explain a volcano, um, I have a, a young daughter and she's really into reading this one volcano book. And just to describe it to her, I might say, well, it looks like a mountain and sometimes it spews lava. Um, that's a very simplistic, not scientifically based um, explanation, but that's my, that might be what it sounds like in um, just a conversation. Then if you look on the right side here, this came out of a fifth grade textbook and it says, a volcano is a rupture in the crust of a planetary mass object. So already for a fifth grader, you, they would have to know what is a rupture and then a planetary mass object, that's a very specific way of writing uh, that earth or another planet. So it becomes a lot more abstract and distant, distant from our lived realities. Um, so we have to, we have to know that it's constructed differently that way. Um, that third example is there as well, um, but I won't go into that one right now. So that's how academic language differs from conversational language. Like students just have to know that there is a difference um, and that when we use academic language, um, it's, it's oftentimes more specific um, and more abstract. Um, so that leads us into students also need to know how academic language is constructed because it's constructed very different from conversational language. Um, there are different um, rules to it. So first and foremost, Academic language compacts information to create really dense sentences. So you can pack a lot of meaning into sentences in academic language. Um, academic language wants us to write in a way where there's not a lot of fluff. 
like you're taking out any extra words um, that in language, in conversational language, we use to kind of connect and weave through the conversation um, that doesn't happen in academic language. So let's take a look at what lexical density is. And this is expected in academic language. So I wanna just counter it with the conversational language. When we think about lexical density, we're talking about nouns and verbs that are used within the sentence. So in conversation, it's typical to have like about four um, of these lexical um, type words, again, verbs or nouns. But then when you get into academic language, eight is very common um, to have in upper elementary school, so like four or six. When you get even higher in the grades, like up into middle school or high school, we're packing a lot of information in these sentences and you could have up to like 12 lexical, um, lexically dense words. So those uh, nouns and verbs. So you can see the difference here too. Like erosion is the action of surface processes removing rock or soil particles. That's a very abstract sentence that students are expected to make sense of in reading. Um, and that's, it's a hard task, but that is the expectation of academic language. So academic language also is written by these insiders. So by scientists or by historians. And within those individual disciplines, they have their own unique ways of talking to one another and then producing that writing. So in science, it is expected that you will just present the information as fact, but there's really no information of how we know what we know. Um, so even if you think about it, like there was the debate over Pluto, um, and now I guess it was several years ago, and trying to like follow that with my fourth graders at the time was really difficult to like answer. Well, like how did they know, first of all, that it was a planet? Why was it a planet? And for me growing up, it was just a fact, Pluto is a planet. But we never really get into how we know what we know and why we know what we know. Um, so science, we just presented as fact. But then in history, we present information very abstractly. So historians will present the information, but give very little uh, evidence of who was responsible for the historical events. So if you read a historical account, um, in one country, you'll get one perspective. In another country, you'll get another. And they don't line up all the time. Um, I remember the first time I went to the UK, I was told that the um, British soldiers just left. And that is not the history that I had been told. So it's really written from our perspectives. And we tried to, the historians tried to present it in a way that doesn't necessarily show the whole truth, but shows their perspectives truth. Okay, next, um, students also need to know that there is general academic vocabulary that goes across the disciplines. And then they also need to know the disciplinary vocabulary and the, the parts of words, um, the morphology. So Sean, I'm gonna have you take away this section. Sean is a vocabulary guru um, and he is going to walk us through this part. All right. Yeah, I, I could talk about vocabulary for hours, so I'll try to keep it brief. So, um, so when we talk about general academic words, um, we're, we're talking about words like the word function. So it's, it's words that can be used across disciplines, um, like in science, social studies, literature, like the word function I used with my class earlier this year, um, like honestly throughout the year, but like what is the function of the skeletal system? So while well, the function of skeletal system, it has many different functions like support, movement, it helps create blood cells, um, it, it, protects your it protects your body. When we talk about function, like in like literature, like the, uh, a fifth grade novel is um, Hatchet. So um, like the hatchet that Brian, the main character has in, the, in that novel, the function of that is like his survival tool. And um, if we think of like history, like the function of like the Colosseum um, in, in, in ancient Rome, where like, you know, they hosted events, like typically like gladiator fights and things like that. So it's a very important word function that can be used across disciplines. Um, so that's like a word that students really, really need to know. Um, 
So that, that's just a, uh, one, one example. So disciplinary vocabulary, it's, it's, it's more technical. We're talking about like even more, um, some people, if people know the different tiers in vocabulary, like tier one vocabulary words are like vocabulary words we know like cat, house. Tier two would be words like academic words, like the word function. When we get into disciplinary vocabulary, we're talking more like tier three words that are very specific to like science or social. As you see on the slide, like ooh, school of fish, like that has, you know, a different meaning than like a school where, you know, we go to or where I, where I teach at or like sedimentary rocks, like that's very specific to a science term. So morphology, um, this is something that's, I think it's getting, academic vocabulary morphology is getting more traction in the science of reading on being extremely important um, to improve overall reading comprehension skills. So when we talk about morphology or like when we break it down to morphemes, it's the smallest units of meaning. Like, so we, if you see on the slide, we have the word microbiology. Well, you can break that word up into prefixes, a root or a base, if you want to call it, or in suffixes, and you could easily figure out some words if you know the morphemes um, that, it, that it carries. So microbiology, it's a word that I taught my fifth graders, you know, just the study of life, and we're talking about little things um, um, in, in life. Um, Today in, um, in my teaching, the word expedition, um, that word expedition came up. So we kind of broke it down and the students were really good. They know X means out. They know um, many of them have head as foot. And I, I would say half my students know that IT um, it, it is a root for go. So when we think about expedition, oh, we're going out on foot and you know we're usually traveling, traveling somewhere that we're trying to find more um, more about. Um, many of those, those academic words like function, they contain many Lat Latin and Greek, Greek roots. So it's important, you know, when we talk about teaching this and assessing um, these sorts of things, like in the science of reading, we should be assessing if kids are, you know, understanding like a generalized vocabulary or, or morphological aspects, typically like the word extract. So extract, you know, X means out, track means to pull. So when students are going to the dentist for um, a tooth extraction or they get a tooth extracted, they, um, you know, now they know what, what that means. Interesting with the word extract though, it can be used in a variety of settings. So when we're talking about um, different um, areas. So in science, you can extract a substance. You could pull out a substance using chemical process. Um, you extract information from a book that you're working on. So it can be used um, in, a, in a variety of different ways. So some words are, are very powerful in our English language and are important to know. All right, thanks, Sean. Okay, so the next, um, the next thing that students need to know is how relationships are constructed across text or within the text. So when we think about um, academic language and really just like the construction of uh, like books or a text, um, there are these logical connections that are made within the text. And these are used to develop the reasoning that comes across the text. So sometimes these can be explicit. Um, in the upper elementary grades, we see it very common in the academic texts that the markers are explicit. So the word because in this sentence, the deer population suffered because of all the snow. So these are explicit markers that can um, help students recognize the relationships across the text. Um, but that's something that students have to be able to recognize. Oh, because it's signaling some type of relationship. What is the relationship? Um, however, when we move into the middle school and high school level texts and we um, do analysis of them, we see that these relationships are implicit. So as the complexity increases, uh, the relationships um, 
may maintain like that same relationship within a sentence, but there's no obvious marker for students to recognize that relationship. So an author could rewrite that previous um, sentence that had an explicit um, marker of the relationship and just say, with all the snow, the deer population suffered. So both of these signal causality. However, the uh, student or the reader has to really do a lot more heavy lifting in that second example um, because there's no obvious marker coming out. Um, we also use, and Sean alluded to this earlier, um, reference. And these are so common in academic texts that um, they're really important for students to know. So the reference are used as chains of reference, again, to accomplish um, making those connections across the text. And we often see these uh, used um, or marked as pronouns and synonyms. So when you think about a pronoun, it could be something as simple as having the banker listed in the first sentence and then he in the second. In this case, um, it's important for students to recognize that he is referring back to the banker. They get more complex. So when we have demonstrative um, pronouns like this, and we're reading this first sentence about white suffragists, and then we get to this, that's a very challenging reference to go back to because students have to recognize or the reader has to recognize that that whole previous sentence is wrapped up in one word of this. So they have to know um, that in that previous sentence, white suffragists um, knew that they would have a better chance of being able to vote um, if they only, well, they knew that they'd have a better chance um, to vote. And then in that next sentence, it says this. So meaning that they know they have a better chance to win and it, then it comes out if they denied um, women of color the, the opportunity to vote. So those are a lot more challenging, but students still have to know how to do that um, to make that connection across the text. And then pro, uh, synonyms are also used. So this is very common as well. Um, and this can be very challenging for um, students who are learning English as an additional language. Um, so we have the printing press used in the first sentence and then the synonym of the invention. So students have to know what that invention is referring back to in the text um, to be able to create meaning across the text. All right, so the next thing that students has to have to know is how to draw disciplinary conclusions. So I mentioned that texts are really written by these insiders um, of the disciplines and each discipline has its own unique um, view on the world, um, way of communicating. So we each have to, or as we read these different disciplinary texts, we have to think about what is it that a literary critic does when they read or a scientist or a historian? So I, I took this from Shanahan and Shanahan um, back in 2012. They really came up with this overview of what disciplinary literacy looks like. Um, and the number one thing that literary critics do when they start to read a text is they assume a critical stance. So they're reading through that critical lens and evaluating um, the text through that lens. Um, and then scientists are really looking to determine the validity of the sources that the scientists share and then the quality of their evidence. Um, they're, they're constantly asking themselves, why? Like, why is this happening? Or like, why did this outcome occur? And then historians are really looking for bias. They're trying to say, okay, what's the perspective of the author? And how could that um, influence the bias that they're presenting in their text? Uh, so really being able to draw these disciplinary conclusions or reading through these various lenses is really important um, for students um, when we think about how to help them with their language comprehension, um, those overall strands. And then the final one is pragmatics. So students also need to know um, the pragmatics of the text. So that includes literary knowledge. So that includes knowing that we read from left to right and top to bottom. Um, this can be a challenge when you think about 
um, various genres, such as a graphic novel, um, teaching students how to read across and then down. And then if there's like different size pictures, which picture or um, text blurb comes next can be a challenge for students as well. And this also differs based on um, various genres. So in some texts, um, you'll have to teach students like how the subheadings um, are used to help organize the text or that students should read the captions to know what's happening in the images. Um, and then this is also very true of um, science. So like when you're reading a scientific um, text, if there's tables, you have to unpack that information. The author will help you typically, but you really do have to, to look at that um, and figure out what is the author trying to say and why did they include the information that they've included. So really those are the overall um, things that you really have to know in order to be successful in language comprehension. Um, and one thing I think that's really important too is to use um, an assessment that is also based in the science of reading. So it's, it's great to have our curriculum um, follow the science of reading, but it's also very important for us to have assessments that are aligned to the science of reading. So the Reading League also has a wonderful um, overview of what scientifically based assessments look like. So they should all include screen, uh, screening, diagnostic, and progress monitoring to inform instruction, um, and then that should prevent future reading difficulties. They should also target foundational reading skills um, to identify what students truly need support in. Um, in the word recognition and decoding, there should be real and nonsense or not real words in, in all syllable types to really measure um, what students know about uh, their the way that words are um, constructed based on syllables. And then they should also address language comprehension skills, such as vocabulary, morphology, syntax, and the other items that we've talked about today. And then the final thing is that they should identify um, trends in group scores. So you should be able to see the areas of need across schools or districts um, to really inform your RTI and MTSS decisions. Okay, so we are gonna take a quick look at um, CAPD assess with read basics. Um, so Sean, do you want to talk a little bit about Sean has used read basics um, and he's going to talk us through a little bit. Okay. Okay. So when we think, well, it's interesting the poll is when I, going back to the poll that it seemed like the majority said um, some said yes. Um, I, I would like to like, it's interesting because I think sometimes we think we're assessing everything like as a fifth grade teacher, but are, are we truly assessing like all the major skills that go into um, skilled reading? So when we, when, when we talk about CAPD assess, um, there's, there's six overall, there's six overall subtests. So um, we talk there and they're, they're, they're pretty brief in nature. So, you know, when I administer to, to my class, generally under it's generally under an hour for sure um i think like the average is about like maybe even 50 minutes 45 minutes um so it's not a very a very long assessment um the strands it's all strands that kind of go in with skilled reading so we have a, a word recognition strand a vocabulary strand morphology like a sentence processing strand so it, it's kind of like a silent reading fluency um, I'm sorry, uh, the reading efficiency strand is a silent reading fluency. Um, we have a sentence processing strand that's quite unique, actually, because it looks at syntax. And um, th those, you don't really see many looking at morphology or syntax. Um, um, out, like, I haven't seen very many out there, for sure. Um, and then there's a basic reading comprehension um, strand as well. So the, overall, we're kind of looking at, like, scientifically based ways of assessing reading. And here's, I think, six sub subtests um, overall that do a very, very nice job. Um, I, I can, I could actually say it about my students. I, I receive very, very good information from it for, for sure. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into um, a little demo. 
And I'm going to pull up some reports and Sean is going to do a little bit of talking through, talking through some of the reports. So I, I am logging into Capti Assess and let me see. Okay. And, and so, as, as, as you're like pulling this up, like just getting back to the strands, it's, it's just really, really important. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm on Twitter a lot, so I, so I, so I have a lot of discussions with with other educators out there, and it seems like, especially after K through two, so lots of you know schools K through two where they're using lots of like CBMs, like oral reading fluency, um, you know, like AIMS Web and things like that. But as you get as you get further along, it seems like we're measuring like reading comprehension, um, which is which is a, a good thing to do, but. If, if a student is struggling in reading comprehension, we, we have to figure out why, like what, what is the reason, you know, is it a student's vocabulary? Is it students um, decoding skill? Is it uh, issues with morphology or silent reading efficiency? So, it, 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 you know, diagnosing that, that is, um, you know, you, you need something to help with that. You know, as, 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 as teachers, you can't just you know, automatically say, oh, I think they have a vocabulary problem. Well, you know, you need some type of assessment to, to see compared to others, well, you know, do, do they really? Okay. Yeah, okay, so let's go ahead and look at the reports and Sean, I'd love for you to share more as we go through. Okay. Mm -hmm. So within Read Basics, Sean mentioned that there are these six subtests. So you're going to get information about each of the subtests um, and these are really, helpful in terms of being able to recognize which foundational skills students may be struggling in that may be limiting their reading comprehension. So this first um, chart here shows whether or not students have taken the subtest. And then we look at scale scores. Um, the scale scores are broken down into weak, low average, high average, and strong. Um, so you get a look this is one class of students. Um, so I have 26 seventh graders in this class. And you can see across the subtest to see um, which area students are struggling in. As a whole class, there are uh, grade equivalencies and then also RTI recommendations. Um, when you look at the RTI recommendation, you can actually change this to better meet your students' um, needs. So some school districts that use Read Basics will change this recommendation um, based off of the, their current capacity to support students um, and just knowing the number of students that they can um, truly serve. So then when we look at students um, more in depth, you can actually see um, student scores across each of the subtests or the foundational skill. Um, and then there's the Lexile here um, that is coming out very shortly. So I included it um, here today. So let's take a quick look at um, when we sort students. So something that's really nice is that there's these six specific skills and you can look at each of these uh, individually. So if I wanted to create intervention groups, I could look here and say, okay, this set of students really need support um, and specifically on the word recognition and decoding um, ETS who designed this assessment found that if you are at 235 or lower um, there's no relationship between your ability to decode and comprehend so it's a big red flag in saying um, the students who score 235 and below truly need decoding support, um, such as phonics and word analysis, um, to be able to increase their um, proficiency in reading, um, and then also comprehension. And it, what's interesting, right. just as a practitioner, you know, you hear like, oh, at like a, this number, like, oh, if students are at 235 or below and in, in, in on the word recognition and decoding, they're going to have troubles, they can't comprehend their, their comprehension won't improve because their decoding skills are, are, are that weak. And interesting with the students that I've been using it with over the last couple of years, it's right on. Like, and it, it, like I was like, okay, so there's gonna be a little bit of uh, like, you know, it might be not perfect, but 
for sure. So students that are under under that like threshold level, um, they have problems um, improving their comprehension. Even as a teacher, I do a lot of vocabulary work in my classroom. You don't you don't see their comprehension scores go up. But once they get to pass that decoding threshold, then all the vocabulary work that I've done throughout the year, um, sometimes I see dramatic improvements over over a few months. So it, it's interesting that it's it, it, for me as just a practitioner, it's been a perfect for for that type of threshold for decoding. Yeah. Okay. So also, um, since we're talking beyond phonics today, really, I want to take a look at one student, and I'm going to select um, Ozzy here, who. If you look at his word recognition and decoding score, it's high. But then when you look across the subtest, there's other areas that he's really struggling in. Um, so I'm looking at his previous scores and I see that um, he's been strong in word recognition and decoding uh, across the year. Um, but then when we look at vocabulary and morphology, he's pretty low, which is probably leading to some um, issues with reading comprehension. So Sean, since you are the vocabulary guru, oh. um, what would you think, like looking at this data, like what does that tell you as a practitioner? Yeah, just, just as a practitioner, you know, I, I, I sort of kind of break things down, you know, like when you think about reading comprehension, like there, there, there has to be, if you're struggling with the reading comprehension, there, there has to be a reason. Is it decoding? Um, it, decoding can play a part, but then you look at the vocabulary and the language piece. So like when I look at this student, that weak vocabulary and morphology skills. So, you know, as a practitioner in the classroom for like tier one interventions, you know, I need to do my best job on teaching vocabulary and morphology um, throughout the school day. Now, if I was in middle school, I would say that's just not in the literacy block either. Like, am I doing morphology with certain words that are in science or like the word expedition came up, you know, for me today, but if you're a social studies teacher in sixth and seventh, you know, do you have 30 seconds to break that word apart? Because I think like then you, you just, it's very impactful for future learning. So when I look at that, I look at, okay, how is my tier one instruction are we doing? And there's a lot of administrators in, in, on, on here. Like, is our tier one instruction, are we spending enough time in vocabulary and morphology? I think a lot of times we assume kids just pick it up by reading and that's just not the case. And then we, then we think like, okay, like we, we, we see the data, what, what, are, what does our tier two and three look like at all, as well? Do we need to, provide these students even more support in that area because they're, they're overall, they're not going to comprehend better unless we boost up vocabulary and morphology in the language areas um, for sure. Yeah, great. Okay, um, that, I think that's a great explanation. And when you go through the student's information, you actually get a detailed um, description of what students can do. And then what is it that would they would benefit from. So we kind of paint a picture of the current reality for students um, based off of the data that we have um, and then give suggestions of what they'll benefit from. Um, and that's for each of the sub tests and the foundational skills. But then we also have specific recommendations based off of student performance. So if student is at a weak performance level, um, in vocabulary, we give you specific um, tools or strategies that students will benefit from. Um, and I think those can be really helpful um, as starting places to say what, what will help students that kind of fall within like this general category. Okay, I'm gonna bring us back to the slideshow. And we'll continue on. Let's see. Okay. All right. Yevgen, did you want to take over here? Yeah. So just to say a few words is that um, this assessment is easy to implement because it integrates with a variety of uh, LMSs, SIS systems, such as Clever and ClassLink is coming this summer. Um, 
let's go to the next slide. And it also comes with the PD. So Margaret has actually has developed a wonderful PD uh, that uh, covers topics on, to help teachers be more effective, sort of more on, on what she's done in a webinar today, but definitely in more detail. Uh, so it covers the science of reading and the foundational skills in depth, uh, who, when, how to assess, how to interpret assessment data uh, with a variety of different case studies, uh, looking at specific students and what to do with them and yeah, what to do with the assessment results. Uh, so that's that's a paid PD, but with this assessment comes with free basic training um, on how to use it. Margaret, do you want to mention these since you're leading these webinars? Yeah, so um, really, Sean and I are working together on another webinar um, where we'll be using the science of reading to specifically look at how to develop um, vocabulary and morphological awareness. Uh, and then we also have another upcoming webinar that um, will focus on clarifying misconceptions of the Lexile framework. Um, we gave a nationwide survey and um, we'll be sharing what we found on that survey uh, and then really how to use Lexile. Um, and those are both in April and registration links will be emailed. They are not in the comments since the chat is disabled. Okay, and uh, if you'd like to take advantage of a free trial that we have going right now, um, reach out to Erica with our sales director. This is her contact information. It will be on the next slide as well. And this is where we go into the Q&A, if there are any questions. I know our team has been answering questions in the background. All right, thank you everyone for attending this webinar.